And now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, a great friend and a great leader, uh, Sean Donovan. And Sean said not to call him secretary, even though he's been the secretary of HUD. Uh, and he said, just call me Sean, so I'm going introduce, to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Sean. Uh, Sean was not only the secretary of HUD, he was also head of OMB. Uh, he has been involved in a number of these issues under President Obama. Uh, he, many of the programs that you have heard of, uh, like the program to bring opportunity to communities was done under Sean's tutelage. One of the things that we worked very closely with Sean on was something called um, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, which was in the original bill in 1968, and no one knew what it meant. It, had, it was just laying there. And Sean, under his leadership, saying, let's develop some regs to give this real meaning. Uh, and he pulled together a number of people. Uh, Phil Tegler, who's in the audience, uh, was there. Uh, I was counseled by people like Steve Fredrickson. Uh, but he said, let's make this real. Uh, and we put together regulations. And not only were these regulations adopted, there was a case going to the Supreme Court uh, whether or not you had to prove intentional discrimination or not uh, in order to, under the Fair Housing Act. And we thought we were going to lose that case. And Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion, uh, citing the work of the of House Institute and a lot of work of Stephen Menendia. But he also cited the regs. So this regs, in many ways, saved us, saved that case. The implications of that is powerful. It's saying it's not enough just to not discriminate. You have to affirmatively develop policies to actually promote inclusion. So it's not just de dealing with structural discrimination, it's dealing with structural inclusion. How do you create structures to affirmatively promote your outcome? And that work was done under Sean Donovan. Now, if you read his bio, you'll read a lot of the stuff I just described. What you won't read in his bio that I want to share with you, and I hope he doesn't think I'm trading on family secrets, is his younger son is uh, living with him in DC, and a star in a rock band. And he said he's been in this band since the third grade. And they played in front of President Obama uh, on the White House lawn. So um, maybe if we're lucky, uh, we not only get to hear Sean, but at some point we might get to hear some of his son's music as well. So join me in welcoming Sean Donovan. Let me start by thanking John, first of all, for being such a remarkable partner in all the work uh, that we did in the Obama administration. Uh, I know I'm not alone in the cabinet, the president himself, in saying that it was his work, uh, as I'll talk a little bit about in my remarks, that inspired uh, a great deal of what we were doing at HUD and beyond. So thank you. I, I also want to say, John, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, as a retired bureaucrat, uh, you know, I don't get invited to as many of these things as I as I used to. And um, honestly, as I think you'll hear as well in my remarks, it is uh, it is a personal honor to be here to reflect on this history. Um, so. I want to say thank you for that as well. Um, one of the things that being a retired bureaucrat does is give you a little more time to reflect on that history. And one of the small but uh, strangely powerful things I learned about the Kerner Commission report um, I want to start on, and, and I want to begin with a little audience poll here. Who knows which day this week is the 50th anniversary of the issuance of the Kerner Commission report? Yeah. Yeah. Nope. One here? I don't know if folks could hear that, but that is exactly the right answer. There is actually no anniversary this week because the Kerner Commission report was issued on February 29th, 
1968. It was a leap day. And the first reason that struck me as powerful is the ways in which that report, the work of the commission, represented a, a truly remarkable leap in our history. I think John has started to outline the reasons for that, but I want to go back and, and touch on three of them. Most importantly, it represented our government stating the unvarnished truth about race relations in our country. In response to three simple questions from President Johnson, what happened? Why did it happen? What can be done to prevent it from happening again? The commission leapt straight to the original sin of the American democracy, slavery and our tragic history on race. On the very first page of the report, it states, quote, segregation and poverty have created in the racial ghetto a destructive environment totally unknown to most white Americans. What white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. This is not an activist speaking truth to power. This is a commission appointed by the President of the United States speaking truth from power. Second, the commission took a leap from those three questions, those simple questions that President Johnson asked, to a vast, comprehensive set of prescriptions. It would have been easy enough, and no doubt politically expedient, to focus on the riots in the narrowest sense. But the commission diagnosed the civil disorders as a symptom of a dangerous and long-standing disease. That disease required attacking a broad range of policy areas from policing and criminal justice reform to employment, education, welfare, and housing. Third, the commission represented a leap forward in the national dialogue about the civil disorders in the summer of 1967 and before because of the members of the commission itself, composed of elected and other uh, public officials evenly split between Democrats and Republicans and drawn from states as disparate as Kentucky, Oklahoma, Ohio, New York, and yes, California. The commission also included the executive director of the NAACP, the president of the Steelworkers Union, and the founder of defense contractor, Lytton Industries. Just think about this for a moment. Think about it. Can you imagine today a bipartisan, geographically diverse uh, presidential commission, including the NAACP, the steelworkers, and a captain of industry, agreeing unanimously that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto? and recommending a comprehensive, ambitious, and I must say as a former budget director, dramatically expensive plan to remedy the underlying causes of racial inequality and poverty? Can you imagine that today? And so this leap of imagination, this leap of faith, this leap of truth demands our attention, demands that we gather to remember and honor the work of the Kerner Commission. But as I think John has rightly said, we honor it best by recommitting to its vision and its prescriptions. I am uh, so thankful that John has organized a series of panels on the history, but also on each of the policy areas that the commission focused on. And building on his point that history is not inevitable here, I want to spend a bit of time talking to you about the work that we did in the Obama administration on many of those policy areas, where I think we made progress, where I think we are under threat right now, but also where we can continue to make progress, particularly at the state and local level. 
One of the primary areas of focus for the commission was policing and criminal justice reform. Half a century later, the original problems not only remain, they have been compounded by four decades of mass incarceration. Despite a new administration in Washington that threatens to revive the worst of these policies, I believe there remains an unusual moment of alignment between citizens and state and local officials across partisan lines that could actually move us forward. President Obama made the moral case for criminal justice reform, most powerfully as the first sitting president to visit a federal penitentiary. He backed up that moral case with reforms and legislative proposals at the federal level and through his policing task force, the state and local level as well. And he showed that change is possible. For the first time in 40 years, the crime rate and the incarceration rate declined together. So it's only right that Black Lives Matter and criminal justice reform is the very first of the topical panels tomorrow. I'm also glad to see that John has added a panel on health and race Thursday morning. Even if healthcare was one of the few policy areas the commission devoted limited attention to, at least directly. But I think the commission understood, as President Obama did, that health is an underlying determinant of opportunity uh, in so many ways. Kids can't learn uh, when their homes give them asthma. Parents can't work when their health is failing. He also understood that African Americans and other minorities had the most to gain from the Affordable Care Act, particularly the expansion of Medicaid. By the fall of 2016, because of the ACA, the black uninsured rate had dropped by almost a full 10 percentage points. And despite the Trump administration's attack on the ACA, a number of the 19 states that have resisted expanding Medicaid are considering it today. This is a place where we have to focus our energy and make Medicaid a reality in those states. A third way that I believe the Obama administration honored the legacy of the Kerner Commission was through our work on race and neighborhoods. Debates continue to this day about whether we should focus on people or place, whether we should rebuild neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, what the commission described as ghetto enrichment, or instead help blacks gain the freedom and the means to move, move out of these neighborhoods. The commission made clear that this is a false choice. We can and must do both. In the last 50 years, we've learned a great deal about what works and what doesn't in revitalizing communities. We've moved from the top-down efforts like urban renewal, or as its critics came to call it, Negro removal, to locally driven strategies anchored by community development corporations working across the full range of policy areas the commission described. While the commission is rarely given credit, it called for this shift in its very first recommendation. Quote, city governments need new and more vital channels of communication to the residents of the ghetto. They need to improve their capacity to respond effectively to community needs before they become community grievances. And they need to provide opportunity for meaningful involvement of ghetto residents in shaping policies and programs which affect the community. And in a diplomatically worded passage from their housing rec uh, recommendations, they suggested, quote, expansion and reorientation of the urban renewal program to give priority to projects assisting low-income households to obtain adequate housing. We tried to honor these recommendations by building a broad set of place-based initiatives at the neighborhood level, things like promise zones and choice neighborhoods that built on the commission's principles. We also work to connect these neighborhoods to jobs and education through regional strategies like sustainable communities and transportation ladders of opportunity. But at the same time that we work to break down barriers that stop African Americans and other minorities from moving to neighborhoods of opportunity, um, but at the same time, uh, we work to break down barriers that stop African Americans and other minorities from moving to neighborhoods of opportunity. Racial discrimination remains far too prevalent 50 years after the commission diagnosed pervasive discrimination and segregation in employment, education, and housing. 
In fact, the Commission's very first housing recommendation was to enact a comprehensive and enforceable federal open housing law to cover the sale or rental of all housing, including single-family homes. Five weeks to the day after the Commission issued its report, Martin Luther King Jr. was gunned down. A week later, President Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act. At HUD, I was given the responsibility to fulfill the promise of the Fair Housing Act, and I tried to do so first by dramatically increasing enforcement, and as John said, codifying and regulation for the first time that even when discrimination is not intentional, it is illegal if actions have a disparate impact on blacks or other protected classes. As he said, this disparate impact regulation won a remarkable, some of us might say stunning, vic uh, five to four victory at the Supreme Court in June of 2015. But legal challenges continue and we cannot let our guard down. Disparate impact remains a central tool in fighting discrimination, not just in housing, but all the areas that the Kerner Commission outlined. And with enforcement against discrimination weakening at the federal level in all of these areas, efforts at the state and local level by advocates, many of whom are in this room today, will necessarily be the front lines of that battle, at least for the next three years. In addition to stepped up enforcement against housing and other discrimination, we pursued a range of strategies to help families living in public or assisted housing or using vouchers be able to move to neighborhoods of opportunity. And for the first time, we gave real meaning and teeth to the Fair Housing Act's requirements that communities that receive federal funds affirmatively further fair housing that they not just fight discrimination, but actively promote racial and economic integration. Calling it social engineering, Secretary Carson has delayed the regulation. Had he read the Kerner Commission report, he would understand that the ghettos themselves were a direct result of social engineering by HUD and other government agencies at the federal and local level. And so HUD and those agencies have a direct responsibility to make it right. I've described a number of ways that President Obama and those of us who work for him tried to live up to the leap forward that the Kerner Commission uh, demanded. But as we gather here to reflect on and honor the legacy of the Kerner Commission, we also need to ask, what is different today, a half a century later? If we wanna truly honor their work, we must make a leap of our own. The next panel is gonna focus a bit on that, but I wanna take one specific area where the world has changed dramatically in the last 50 years, and that's our cities. To help answer President Johnson's second question, why did it happen? The commission devoted an entire chapter to tracing the formation of the racial ghettos. The touchstone of this history is what's come to be known as the great, great black migration into our cities during the first half of the 20th century and what I will call the great white migration, out of the cities and into the suburbs. To help answer President Johnson's third question, what can be done to prevent it from happening again? The commission devoted an entire chapter to predicting the future of cities. Their conclusion was sobering. The future of these cities and of their burgeoning Negro populations, they said, is grim. Most new employment opportunities are being created in suburbs and outlying, outlying areas. And of course, their conclusion was right up to a point. But 50 years later, that point has passed. I believe we're witnessing the next great migration in our history back to our cities. And if we don't pay attention, the consequences for African Americans and low-income families will also be grim. This trend is not just here in the US. Around the world, more than half of the population for the first time now lives in urban areas. The reasons for this new migration in the US are many. The growth of a post-industrial economy and the jobs that go with it, lower crime from demographic and other factors, urban revitalization efforts, the limits of the suburban automobile geography, and I could go on. I, don't want, I also don't wanna overstate the case. Neighborhoods in Detroit or Newark or other cities that burned 50 years ago could still rightly be described as ghettos today. But my point here is not a lecture 
on the recent history of the American city. My point is that the very clear urban bad, suburban good frame of the Kerner Commission report is changing. And we ignore it at our peril because to be provocative, the only thing worse than an urban ghetto is a suburban or rural ghetto. Look around the world. In South Africa, apartheid began with whites removal of blacks from the cities. And today the townships are largely not only deeply poor, but geographically remote from transportation, jobs, and other levers of opportunity in ways that most poor urban neighborhoods in the US are not. In Europe, suburban ghettos cut off from opportunity are fermenting racial and religious prejudice into radicalism. In many ways, the US is catching up to the pattern of older cities around the world, where the wealthy occupy the center and the poor are pushed to the suburbs and beyond. Does this sound familiar, Bay Area in California? So what do we do about this? First, we must make a leap from the prescription of the Kerner Commission, which called for policies which will incur, quote, encourage Negro movement out of central city areas to really understand what makes for a neighborhood of opportunity, be it urban, rural, or suburban. The, the really important work that John Powell has done to map opportunity is a perfect example. And the potential use of it by the state of California shows a way to move policy forward when the federal government is moving backward. We built on John's work in the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that I talked about, creating for the first time an opportunity index that covered the entire country. Armed with this knowledge, we can better decide how to revitalize neighborhoods of concentrated poverty and where to help low-income families move to access opportunity. Second, we need to develop a new set of tools that focus on gentrification and the other risks faced by cities gaining jobs and population. In housing, this includes affordable housing preservation, inclusionary zoning, displacement and eviction prevention, to name just a few. Third, we need to develop a new set of tools that focus on the suburban and rural communities that increasingly suffer from what we always called urban problems. We need to start asking ourselves questions like, what does good community policing look like in the suburbs? How can we harness the revolution in ride sharing to create low cost micro transit systems? What should we do with vacant shopping malls? And where will the jobs come from in the Mississippi Delta? My focus on the changing geography of opportunity in our country comes from my fundamental belief that where we live determines the shape of our lives, a point the Kerner Commission made brutally clear. And it comes from my personal experience growing up in New York City at a time when the Bronx was burning, when many said we were witnessing the death of the American city. A few weeks ago, walking through the South Bronx, I saw beautiful mixed income housing where rubble had smoldered decades before. I saw playgrounds crowded with children where wild dogs had roamed. And I saw low-income families, black and brown, desperately trying to afford staying in neighborhoods they desperately thought about leaving a few decades ago. Of course, it isn't just our cities that have changed in the last half century. We elected our first black president. And as ta Coates has argued, we then elected our first white president. We come together today at a moment of great peril for the national project that the Kerner Commission called us to embark on 50 years ago. That threat is real in all the policies the Trump administration is trying to roll back, including so much of the criminal justice, health care, fair housing, and community development work that I've described today. But that threat is also real in the assault on truth and the contest over whose history truly reflects this country. A toxic brew of social media fueled disaffection, money in politics, and other woes has brought us to an age of tribalism. I think this is the other reason that the release of the Kerner Commission report on Leap Day 1968 is strangely powerful for me. As we gather to reflect on the 50th anniversary, the actual day February 29th, 
has literally disappeared from the calendar. Our job in the age of Trump is to make sure that the Kerner Commission report does not disappear from our history. The commission made clear that responsibility lay not just on our government and leaders. Quote, from every American, they said, it will require new attitudes, new understanding, and above all, new will. So let me make this personal. I wouldn't be here today, a white man opening a conference on race and inequality, if it wasn't for finding the history of the civil rights movement. Starting in college with the great Martin Luther King biography, Parting the Waters, next in graduate school, retracing the route of the Freedom Rides, I learned from the tragic history of race in this country that the American project is a paradox that begins with the original sin of slavery and follows a halting arc of protest and progress. I learned that only in trying to further that struggle could I help give truth to the words of our founding fathers, written even as they knew all men were not equal in America. It was only in facing that paradox that I understood black history is American history, that black history is my history. If we are not going to let that history disappear, we must remember the words of the commission. Quote, it is time now to turn with all the purpose at our command to the major unfinished business of this nation. It is time to adopt strategies for action that will produce quick and visible progress. It is time to make good the promises of American democracy to all citizens, urban and rural, white and black, Spanish surname, American Indian, and every minority group. Thank you.